Hello and welcome to the Potential Psychology Podcast. I'm your host, Ellen Jackson, and it's my mission to share the science of human behaviour in a practical, fun and inspiring way. In each podcast episode, I interview an expert from the fields of psychology, well-being, leadership, parenting or high performance. I pick their brain to uncover what they know about living well, what tips do they have for you and I, and I quiz them about how they apply their expertise in their own life. Join me as we discover simple, science-backed ways to live, learn, flourish, and fulfill your potential. This is episode 14, and my guest today not only shares two of my personal passions of psychology and yoga, but she combines the two in her professional practice. Susie Redding is a UK-based psychologist, yoga instructor, and personal trainer. She is the author of The Self-Care Revolution, which was published in the UK late last year and here in Australia earlier this year, and she's here to talk to us about nurturing head, heart, and body. Welcome, Susie. Thank you so much for having me, Ellen. I'm so looking forward to talking with you today. Oh, that's wonderful because I have lots of things to talk to you about as well. <laughs> and I'm going to, we'll, we'll cover your book and we're going to cover all of the different um, facets of your work, but I'm really interested to know what you mean by nurturing your head, heart and body. Okay. So what I'm referring to there is the concept of self-care. Um, and I think as a concept, we've, we've all heard about it. Um, I think we'd all agree that it's something useful that we should be engaging in. But at the same time, I think it's really poorly understood. And it's until we have a practical working definition of what self-care is, it's really hard to commit to it. So I define self-care as nourishment, and it's nourishment for the head, the heart, and the body. And I'm really passionate about empowering people with the tools to nurture themselves on all of those different layers of their being. Because I think if you, traditionally, we're, we're pretty good at taking care of our physical health, right? We all know it's necessary to move. We've got to nourish ourselves with what we eat. Um, it's not selfish to get a good night's sleep. It's certainly not indulgent to brush your teeth and have a shower. But when it comes to the stuff that nurtures us energetically, emotionally, and mentally, I think there's a little bit more resistance there or there's stigma or people think, oh, gosh, do I really need that? Yeah, we do. So yep. it's nourishment for the head, the heart and the body. Yeah. Okay. And, and I think we can probably unpack that a little bit more in a moment. One of the things that interests me is particularly as psychologists, the, the head part, I suppose, mm -hmm. and that is, you know, I think there is a lot of discussion about self-care and it's kind of, you know, we all need to... Uh, take bubble baths and, you know, have a night out with the girls and those sorts of things, which absolutely are nurturing. But mm -hmm. I kind of feel that it's probably more complex than that. Is it more complex than that or am I just making yeah. it more complex? No, no, I think you're spot on. Self-care, I think it's, it's really an art form and it's a mindfulness practice in itself. Self-care really involves us getting very quiet and tuning in with where we're at where our head is at, you know, energetically where we're at, the emotions that we're experiencing and thinking very proactively about what is it that we need to top ourselves up to boost our resilience or to just express how it is that we're feeling. That's not easy. Um, and quite often it's very difficult to do on your own. Sometimes we need uh, in partnership with someone else, you know, the dialogue, an opportunity to give voice or um, so if, from what I experience personally and what I see in my consulting room is that when we need self-care the most quite often it drops away and we're time poor and frazzled and what I call energetically bankrupt and it can be so hard to put your finger on what it is that you need to do or the things that you would normally do to replenish yourself become inaccessible at those times in life so we need a whole new toolkit when we're least resourceful to come up with it so mm -hmm. you're spot on. It's, it's a real art form. And until we get self-care on the radar and we're talking openly about it and we've, we're all building a self-care toolkit that has real breadth, yeah, it's, it's, it can be very difficult to engage in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a frazzled, overworked mother who's mm -hmm. trying to, you know, do everything for everyone and, and perhaps putting myself last, and I know I see a fair bit of that. I try not to do it myself, but maybe I'm guilty of it too occasionally. 
Yes. And, you know, I've tried the glass of wine or I've tried the bubble bath or I've tried to go to bed early with a book, but it's really just not cutting it for me. It just doesn't seem to be helping. Where would you start with someone to explore what kind of self-care they really need? Okay. Now, the reason why I'm sitting here today is because I've learned all of this the hard way. And, <laughs> yeah. And I, and I want people to know that even psychologists get the blues and it doesn't matter what tools you, you have at your fingertips reach, whether you're a psychologist, yoga teacher, personal trainer, I'm all three. I still found myself literally lying flat on my back, floored by life because life sometimes does that to us and no one is immune. For someone that's in that state of what I call energetic bankruptcy, your body is literally crying out for rest. It's crying out for sleep. And there are times in life when, yeah, we know that's what we need, but it's, it's inaccessible regardless mm -hmm. of all the positive choices that we make. So I would suggest really building a very soothing toolkit of, of practices, skills and activities that are really largely around healing and soothing the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And that's where we launch straight into our conversation about yoga because okay. <laughs> that, that, that was my tonic um, and that would be where I would start. And as a psychologist, whether people are coming to me as a psychologist or a yoga teacher, everyone walks away with some kind of yoga sequence prescribed because mm -hmm. it is such a powerful tool. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about rolling out your mat and being on it for an hour. I'm talking about a particular shape that will help you feel the, the way that you want to feel, okay, whether that's something that's going to be uplifting instead of a third coffee in the afternoon or something that's going to help you soothe and unwind for two minutes before you go to bed or when you feel scary mummy showing up, hi, <laughs> I know all about her, there'll be either some kind of breathing exercise, a visualisation tool or a posture that will help you soothe and, and reboot. Okay, so can you tell us a bit more about how you came to yoga yourself? Sure. What, what led you down that path to then progress it and make all these further discoveries? It was many moons ago in a previous life. Um, I was an ice skater. So um, <laughs> it was part of cross training, part of way, my way of, of building strength and flexibility and stamina for my sport. That was my first introduction and it was also there helping me rehabilitate a back injury. And I had a, a, a regular practice through that time, but it was when I started working as a personal trainer in the UK, which was also by accident, that I was asked by the establishment that I was working for to teach yoga. And I thought, oh, okay, that, I can do that, but I need to go out and do training. So that's when I embarked on the yoga teacher training in the UK. And what I loved was that it was this incredible bridge between my training as a psychologist and, and working as a personal trainer, it was, it was the thing that brought those two things together. And it's about the breath. It's about the meditative quality. Um, yeah, it, it has elements of, of everything that we need to thrive as individuals. Yeah, and it's such a fascinating thing, isn't it? Because I, I've practised yoga for, I'd say, 16 or 17 years now reasonably consistently. There might have been some periods where my practice kind of lapsed, but reasonably consistently. And that was actually before I became a psychologist myself. I'd done undergraduate study, but hadn't pursued my further study to get registered. And I hadn't really, I don't think, made a good, clear link between the two until relatively recently. I think once I, I knew that I loved it, I knew that it helped me in body and mind. You know, it was great to feel strong and, and flexible. I like the challenge because I think with yoga, you're always learning something. You know, you never get to a point, and maybe you don't with any exercise. I don't know. I haven't pursued that many others for this length of time, but you never actually get there. You're always improving, which appeals to yeah. my strength of, of love of learning. And so it was only really when I started to read, I suppose, about mindfulness and some of those psychological concepts that I started going, oh, this is just all one and the same, but, but coming at it from different perspectives. Yes. Yeah, I think you're spot on there. I, I think when we're trying to create change or when we're looking at enhancing well-being, there are three ways in. And it comes down to what people are interested in, their natural preferences and their interests. You can work with the mind, you can work with the body, and you can work with the breath. So 
as a psychologist, as a yoga teacher, I, I almost don't see any distinction between them. But I think it's life experience that's really shown me the therapeutic benefits of yoga. When I first started practicing it, like I said, it was about sporting performance. And then when I was working as a personal trainer, I was using yoga as a tool to, to aid, you know, people's fitness for running marathons or, or just coping with work stress. But it was my life experience of motherhood colliding with my father's terminal illness. And I was deeply traumatized by that. And it was my yoga practice that really kind of put me back together. But that yoga practice looked vastly different to the one that I was doing as an ice skater. So it, it's, it's something that constantly evolves. And, and now I'm more passionate about really it's, it's, it's healing. It's soothing the nervous system. It's, it's not about grand poses or elaborate sequences. It is literally earthing the body, a sense of feeling held gentle movement that somehow allows you to process experiences, process emotions, to release the stuff that's held in the cells and fibre of your body. The fact that you can have a feeling of catharsis, physical catharsis, without even knowing what it is that you're letting go, it's, it's quite profound. And, and sometimes with my own experience there, when I was talking to psychologists about how I was feeling, and I, I, you know, clearly a huge advocate of therapy, sometimes just talking about it doesn't let you move past the experience. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can actually end up being re-traumatised by just reliving that experience again. And I found that the yoga practice coupled with talking therapy was the thing that allows me, it allowed me to give voice, but then it also allowed me to release what was held in my body and to open up my body to breathe again, because I think grief and trauma can have a huge impact on our ability to breathe and, and just stress and life in general, isn't it? So the mantra there is breathe better and you feel better. And it was the yoga practice that did that very subtly. So if I were to just sit and say to myself when I was in that state, breathe better, that actually amplified my feeling. <laughs> it makes it worse, doesn't it? There was real constriction. I, there was such a holding that I couldn't take a deep breath. But if I came into a child's pose, I could feel how the breath moved into the back of the body. Or if I did some twists or I did some side bends, I could physically feel my body opening up to receive the fullness of the breath. And that was deeply, deeply healing. So um, I sort of see yoga as body-centred psychotherapy. Um, mm -hmm. And I think really that the core there is that there's no separation between mind and body. You can't separate physical health from mental health. Um, and like I said, you, you can work with the thoughts, you can work with movement, you can work with breath, and they will all come together to, to help release and help us move through and to, 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 to build well-being. Um, and you, you nailed it there when you said that, you know, yoga is essentially a moving mindfulness meditation practice and how powerful is that yeah and I find that concept of the breath and again this is something that I've had to discover and, and I think that's the thing about yoga it's one of the things that I find so difficult and, and even in this conversation is it's a bodily and mental experience that is very difficult to explain to somebody perhaps who hasn't experienced it themselves mm -hmm. a little like meditation you know we can talk about meditation and I'm, I'm always very keen to say it's not you know sitting in the lotus position and going oh you know it's 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 you know more practical than that but it really is a lived yeah. experience thing we can't really fully understand it until we practice it but for me that breath concept you know I had never thought about how I breathed before until I started doing yoga I just it was just a given well of course everybody breathes you know what, what on earth are you going on about but you do through that physical practice, especially when your instructor reminds you in certain poses, remember to breathe. And you realize then that you have stopped breathing, <laughs> you know, not for long yeah. life, you know, your body, the system's yeah. not going to allow you to stop breathing for long, but you do stop breathing. And then I think that consciousness of your breath and your consciousness of the way you hold your body, you yes. then take out, you know, off the mat into everyday life and start to then pay attention to oh, I, I have stopped breathing, you know, I'm tense or I'm agitated and I've actually stopped, or my breathing feels really tight and yeah. shallow or, you know, I'm having trouble getting a deep breath and, and what that signifies in terms of 
you know, maybe there's something I'm anxious about, maybe it's distress, you know, it really is a wonderful signal to you once you learn to pay attention to it. That's right. That's right. And, and, and what you've explained really beautifully there is that the yoga practice itself literally repatterns your breathing and it, it actually recalibrates it. So it, it changes how you breathe the rest for the rest of your day. It's not just while you're on your mat and what the postures are doing. You're, 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 you know, when you get tight chest muscles, if you think about everyday life, our shoulders are drawn forwards from being on our phones or computers or driving or carrying things and those muscles get caught short and that actually diminishes your ability to take a deep breath in. So, you know, the, the heart opening postures are there to open up the chest muscles, the, the side opening postures open up the intercostal muscles between the ribs, the forward bending postures open up the back body. So you're physically creating space for a more complete breath. And you also touched on something really important there. It's the postures themselves. It's the shapes that you come into that has a really potent effect on your subjective energy levels, on your mood, on your mental clarity. And there's, if, if, if people are interested in learning a little bit more about how our posture affects the way we think and how we feel, Google Eric Pepper. He's okay. a psychologist that's done some really fascinating research into the postures that we adopt and how it affects how we feel. And before when I was saying about, you know, a single yoga pose, well, there are shapes that I will use. If I've got an important phone call to make, I'll, I'll come into a tree pose or a warrior pose because that's uplifting and it's focusing and it's energizing. But if I need to soothe and calm my body, that's the opposite of what I need. It'll be some kind of, it'll be a downward dog or it'll be legs up the wall or it'll be a child's pose. So I love that yoga builds this toolkit and it's the breath and it's the shapes that we come into and it's the presence of mind, it's those three things that are essential. And then that, that also leads us to other things like mantra. And I think your question earlier of how can we integrate self-care into the lives of, of busy people, okay, we're breathing anyway so we can work yep. with the breath. It doesn't take any extra time. It's very portable it's, it's and free. <laughs> quality of the breathing. We can use mantras, we can use affirmations, and we can work with a posture, and we can work with really simple movements like little shoulder rolls. If you're finding tension is rising, just take some gentle movements. If you want to shift how you think, move your body. It's so, so simple. Yeah, amazing. And, and one of the things that, one of the programs that you run, you call Walk and Talk, which intrigued me because I've been doing a lot of, I, I practice what I call my wellbeing walks um, yeah. most days if I can, uh, partly for, and I've spoken to another guest, James Garrett, about this as well, about uh, the benefits to creativity. You know, the fact yes. that walking helps you, your creativity, just helps you to think differently. It's great for when you get to that mm, just after lunch sort of lull where you really yeah. just, you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. So, you know, huge advocate of, the walk, even as a punctuation between tasks when you find your attention waning. Um, but you have a, a specific walk and talk program. What, what do you do? Yeah. In that? So I first started offering walk and talk sessions when I lived in Manly in Sydney, oh, Manly Beach. I know it well. I lived there myself for six oh, years. Wonderful. <laughs> it was like, well, why, why would I meet in a consulting room yeah. when we can take the sweep in of Manly Beach all the way around to Shelley Yes. So with a walk and talk, what you're harnessing there is the therapeutic benefits of talk, the therapeutic benefits of nature, the natural antidepressant effects of movement, and the fact that instead of just sitting down and encouraging my client to close their eyes and sort of work on mindfulness, gratitude and savouring skills using their imagination – we could go out into this beautiful environment and just do it on the hop where we're, we're literally doing it anyway. And the other thing I love about a walk and talk session is that there's a real sense of we're in it together. We're walking side by side. It takes out that feeling of sitting opposing someone where sometimes that can be a bit confronting. Sometimes in that just being seated and, 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 and directly looking at each other, there's a sense of, you start to analyse what you say before you've said it, or you, it, it, by walking. It just intensifies everything, doesn't it? It does. By yeah. walking, it just kind of circumvents all of that stuff, so you're not as self critical. And it literally, as a therapist, it helps me get out of my own way. And we're just in the moment together. 
And I know that that's what my clients say, that it just, it helps them get to the nub of the issue far quicker. And I think it taps into this innate resourcefulness and creativity that you've, you've mentioned. And, you know, we're, we're standing tall in that, that open-hearted, long spine posture, which naturally makes you feel more resourceful as opposed to sitting in a consulting room with that rounded posture that makes us a little more inward looking and that can lower mood and subjective energy levels. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. So it really is the full integration there of, of all of those pieces that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interesting. I have another colleague, who, uh, Shell Taylor, who I also interviewed previously for the podcast, who is a child and family psychologist. Mm. And she and her practice partner will do a lot of walking. They have therapy dogs. So they have dogs in the wow. practice and they'll actually take kids out and walk with them, with the dogs. For a lot of those similar sorts of reasons, you know, when I've talked to Shell about this and I I will get either she or Jess on at some stage to talk about the animal assisted therapy, but that it just makes it so much easier, especially for a child. You know, it's not confronting, it's a far less scary environment. They can talk about what the dog's doing and then they do all this wonderful work where they start to kind of talk about how the dog might be feeling and, you know, really able to help the child open up and, and translate what they're experiencing through perhaps, you know, their ideas of the words of the dog, if that makes sense. So, but yeah, very much part of it was that getting outdoors, Mm. walking side by side, breaking down that kind of, you know, somewhat threatening environment of a face-to-face consulting room. This is all very intense and serious. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I very much look forward to listening to that one. <laughs> yes. And you're so right. You know, those, those in, incredibly therapeutic benefits of, of nature and, and animals and sharing the journey. Yeah. Mm, so you don't have access to Manly Beach anymore to walk <laughs> along. Where, where do you take, where do you walk with clients now? So these days there, there are two favorite places. So I've, I've swapped the ocean for woodlands with deer beautiful or an ancient ruined castle so you know it's a different you won't get either of those on manly beach (laughs) (laughs) and what fascinates me is that different environments have different energetic effects so what i loved about manly beach was this real sense of there's a cleansing property Uh, and i grew up in curl curl on of the cliffs i i love that those cliffs really represent a sense of a real equanimity, you know, that they can withstand the battering of the waves. That's a completely different energetic effect to the, the, the woodlands, yeah, to this feeling of, of, of stability and, and the greenness, the lushness of it, or this ancient ruined castle where you just get this sense of real history that in, in Australia we don't have because we don't have no. structures like that. I mean, obviously there's Uluru and, and, and other ancient um, spiritual sites that it's it's amazing how different places will channel a different feel so it's just something to play with as an individual if you if you sort of feel like you want to broaden possibilities well go somewhere that's a really open space or if you want to feel safe well, trees provide that if you want to feel washed clean go and sit and feel the, sp- the spray of the ocean on your face it's, it's fascinating. I'd love to see more research into that, actually. Yeah, it, it, that is really interesting. And I think that's something that is very, I almost wonder whether, I know I've looked at a bit of the research around the benefits of viewing the ocean or water and, and certainly nature and, and those sorts of things. I know we have a lake in Ballarat here and I intentionally, and I, I know a lot of our college, you know, my fellow psychologists here um, will intentionally drive from one side of town to the other via the lake, even though it's not necessarily the most direct or expedient yeah. route, but just for that experience of seeing it in all of its varying you know last night I drove past and it, it was sunset and it was calm and mm. you could see the outline of the black swans oh, and the mirrored reflection of the sunset and the lake it was just glorious and, and other days you'll go down there and it looks quite wild because it's really choppy and gray and, and there's wind I think intuitively we're drawn to those sorts of things so it's so interesting now that we're starting to get some research to support why it is that Mm. we feel these things are beneficial why are we drawn to the ocean why do we like to sit in front of an open fire you know Mm. what are the kind of therapeutic benefits Mm. to the things at some level and yet we've probably in a lot of ways removed ourselves from that 
as well. You know, we, we sit in cars and offices and inside houses and we force ourselves to sit at desks for long periods and we think mm. that somehow that's the right thing to do when even from a productivity point of view, it's so not the right thing to do. And from Absolutely. a wellbeing point of view, it's so not the right thing to do. Yeah, it's intriguing. And uh, I mean, I'm sure there will be a lot more research yeah. in that area. Can I take you back to yoga just for a moment? Because one of the sure. things that's really, I've done some yin yoga recently and for, well, you could probably explain this better than I could for people who are not aware of yin yoga, but it, it's a far, it's a more meditative, slower form mm-hmm. of yoga. You stay in poses for long periods, don't you? And mm-hmm. you have to, you know, really kind of, be very present and sometimes you're actually starting to use your breath and because you're going, this is actually getting really uncomfortable. (laughs) So, you know, how do I stay in that moment? Mm. And during our classes at the yoga studio that I practice at, our teacher's been talking about the the eight limbs of yoga Mm -hmm. and some of the philosophies behind this This is a a very long-standing Eastern practice. And as I'm listening to these explanations from a a yoga-centric point of view, I'm thinking, this is a lot of what we talk about in psychology as well. There just seems to be these incredible parallels. Mm. As, a, as a yoga instructor who's, you know, presumably had more training in that area than certainly I have, what do you see as the parallels between some of these limbs of yoga, for example, and psychology? Sure. I, I think there's an enormous crossover. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, so the eight limbs of yoga, should we just briefly have a quick look? Yeah, yeah go through them. Go through so, them. The first one is yamas, and that's basically ethics. It's it's how you you live your outer life. It's um, concepts like um, doing no harm, truthfulness, non-stealing, um, containment. It's also the one that I really like. The yama that I really like is a parigraha, and this is about non clinging. And I think it's a really essential component of mindfulness. Now, mindfulness is essentially that choiceless awareness. And, and that yama is really talking about not clinging to any moment, just allowing it to be as it is. So I, I find that one is quite powerful. Um, yeah, and some of those other things you're talking about seem very, you know, to me, especially from a positive psychology perspective, we call them values. Yes. You know, they kind of ethic values, what, what's meaningful to me as an individual that kind of guides my behaviour, my beliefs, my goals, etc. Absolutely, absolutely. And at the heart of that, the whole point of it is these outer observances are there to restrain our tendency to see ourselves as separate. So really it's, it's linking with compassion mm. and so with the, the, the wave of acceptance and commitment therapy. I think that's, that's the yeah. parallel there. Yeah. Really powerful. And that common, common humanity kind yes. of concept that you have in self-compassion. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Um, and then the second limb is niyamas. Now that's looking at inner observances. That's spiritual practices like purity and contentment and trying to clear the residue and, self-reflection and and a connection to the divine so there are all sorts of different practices that 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 we would weave in there and then the next limbs are looking at asana so that's actually the physical practice and we've talked at length about the different shapes that we hold and how that affects how we feel Um, and then the next limb is pranayama that's looking at specific breathing exercises and again you breathe better you feel better and then the last four limbs are all about turning the attention inwards. It's about concentration, focus, um, the withdrawal of senses, and all of that leads us to a state of bliss. So that the last four limbs are really about a meditative state. Um, I think there are other yoga sutras that are really useful. And it's what I particularly like from Patanjali, the five cliches. And they are Again, again it's, it's kind of coming back to mindfulness and compassion. So the cliches are all about, basically, Patanjali was saying that there are five sources of suffering. And I think that's really useful from a perspective of, of positive psychology because that's what we're looking at, isn't it? You know, mm, what are the mm. foundations for a life worth living? So these yep. five um, causes of suffering are ignorance of our inter- eternal nature. So not realising that within everybody is a sense of divinity. It's about suffering is caused from seeing yourself as separate and divided from the rest of the world. 
It's caused by an attraction and attachment to impermanent things. It's caused by an aversion to things that are unpleasant or clinging to things that are. That's the stuff that I find really useful and that's the stuff that I feel that brings my mindfulness in everyday life to life. <laughs> it, yeah, that, that brings it brings it home. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's there's lots of interest. I'm, I'm sort of working through the parallels there between you know what I understand of aspects of positive psychology outside of mindfulness, even that sort of non clinging piece that you were talking about, you know, there's even yeah. some kind of uh, cognitive behavior, what we call cognitive behavioral type elements to that as yeah. well, you know, acknowledging your thoughts, acknowledging yeah. that you have power over your thoughts, that your thoughts drive your feelings um, and yeah. your behavior, they're all interlinked yes. and that you do once you become aware of that as a concept and then you become aware of starting to notice some of those automatic thoughts that you have control and power over those. That's it. And it's acknowledging that you are not your thoughts. You are not mm. your emotions. You're not your sensations. You're not your memories. You experience those things, but who you are is, is actually far bigger than just a thought. And yeah. that's and you can let them such go. a powerful concept, isn't it? Mm. Um, mm. And there's another yoga sutra that's all about, and this really links beautifully to positive psychology. So Patanjali is talking about the four attitudes that, that, that uplift, and it's about, friendliness to the joyful, compassion for those that are suffering, celebrating the good in others yeah. and remaining impartial to the faults and imperfections of others. Okay. Yeah. And again, lots of, you know, bits of self-compassion in there. Um, yeah. A bit of acceptance stuff yeah. in there as well. Gratitude it really does tie a lot of these concepts together. And it's so fascinating that this is stuff that has been around for thousands and thousands of years. And you know, the, the science, I suppose, because positive psychology is actually the science, you know, it, it's the practice. And we talk a lot in this podcast about the practice of it, but beneath that practice is a huge and, and increasingly uh, growing body of research mm. that underlies that, you know, that really starts to understand the mechanisms or trying to understand the mechanisms behind it and, and support, you know, evidence for the practice is actually, you know, being beneficial and useful to people. So um, mm. these two worlds are colliding um, in, a, in a wonderful way and, and perfectly situated within what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. And one of the areas that you work in, so you work with individuals, mm -hmm. but you also work with organisations and workplaces? I do, yes. So yeah. it's, it's funny how life takes a full circle. So I originally, I specialised in organisational psychology. So I've got a master's degree in org psych. And then I promptly moved to the UK and there were parts of my degree that weren't recognised here in the UK. And I, after doing six years of uni, I just thought, oh, I don't fancy doing this <laughs> So that's when I started working as a personal trainer and I did that for a decade and then it was when I moved back to Australia that I rec reclaimed my psychological practice and, and that was really because of life experience and I felt like you know, I qualified in my 20s. I felt like I, I hadn't done enough living to be, to, be, to be working with the kind of authenticity that I wanted to. As a health coach, Jobs are good, and you know that was that that fit yep. very comfortably, but it was really, yeah, my life experience that led me to to feel like I'd earned my stripes. I'd had my dark night of one of my dark nights of the soul, and I felt like having been through that and clawed my way back to a feeling of, of vitality. I, I I had a toolkit that I know I, I knew I could share with others, and then yes, so more recently I'm sharing that toolkit with organisations. It's it's come full circle. So I give. They, they call them lunch and learn sessions, which I love. Yes, yes. So it's a one-hour talk over lunch. And, and generally it's topics of self-care or we're looking at goal setting and motivation or how to de-stress without leaving your desk. Leave your desk if you can, of course, but, you know, little tips and tools that can sustain us throughout our day or how to promote better sleep and what to do in the absence of good sleep. And I just, I love what I wanted to do when I embarked on that degree in, in organisational psychology was to infuse the workplace with a little more humanity to make sure that organisations were actually genuinely tending to the health and well-being of their staff. And that's what's happening now. 
10 years ago, it was more sort of like site testing and organizational change and stuff like that. And I didn't feel like there was the right fit. But Mm. now there's, it's with the paradigm shift of positive psychology, we're so aware of how easy it is to, to make really tangible change with these kind of practices and organizations are embracing that. And I love that it's genuinely about the well-being of their staff. It's not so much about increasing productivity and reducing absenteeism. It is genuinely loving their staff to retain them and to, to get the best for everyone. Yeah, it has changed significantly, hasn't it? Because I, I started out in workplace psych and, and organisational type stuff, probably it is, well, I don't know, I can't even think how long ago it was now, but anyway, but for very similar reasons, it just, it didn't appeal in a in that traditional sense. And even the notion of organisational psychology, I'm like, oh, it's so dry because <laughs> traditionally it was. And yeah. yet you're right, you know, it's changed. And, and now getting opportunities to go into workplaces and talk to people about well-being and even productivity, but from a well-being perspective, you know, so it's not so much how do we shape a job so that we can eke the last, you know, ounce out of these people. It's, you know, what do we know about well-being and how that actually leads to success. You know, Sean Acor's stuff about, you know, how we've got it kind of backwards and and we need to, um, you know, appreciate that people when they're happy are more successful. They are more productive. You know, it really is a win-win scenario. Um, and having the, you know, the joyful experience of being able to go in and talk to people in workplaces about this stuff because people get it. You know, mm. they, they just get it. It just makes sense and they want it. And from my perspective, and, and I suspect this is what you experience as well, you know, work with air for so much of our day, week, month, year life, that if we can start to use this as an opportunity to access, you know, through lunch and learn or through any of these sorts of uh, development opportunities, you know, get people talking and thinking about this stuff Mm. and creating a language around it Mm. in a workplace, um, encouraging people to take those breaks and have those walks and, you know, talk about their health and mental health and well-being. Um, It really is just, it can only do good, I think. Absolutely. Yes. I'm with you. 100%. 100%. <laughs> Preaching to the converted here, obviously. And Susie, tell us a bit about your book, The Self-Care Revolution. I mean, I suspect we've probably covered a lot of the sorts of things you talk about, but what, what led you to the author life? Well, I started writing that book through, well, nearly four years ago now. So when I had my little boy, it was my way of creating something on the career front, but while being present for him. So when he slept, I would tap away at the computer. And to be honest with you, that first draft was really a kind of cobbling together of blog posts that I'd been writing for about five years. And what I wanted to to share with people was a framework of self-care because I I knew, knew firsthand the profound therapeutic potential of self-care and I and I was sharing that with clients and I was seeing how self-care was empowering them with the tools of self-care was changing their lives but what people needed was some kind of set of categories because as I said earlier it's so hard to put your finger on some kind of nourishing nourishing act when you need it the most so that's why I created the vitality wheel and basically the vitality wheel is a synthesis of all of my studies as a psychologist, so organisational and performance psychology, sports psychology, more recently positive psychology, it's acceptance and commitment therapy, mindfulness, CBT, um, yoga philosophy as well, and also my experience as a health coach. Um, and you'll, you'll see it's, it's quite closely linked to Seligman's PERMA model, yeah, in terms of um, positive emotions and social connection and meaning and that sort of stuff. But I wanted to reflect also physical health because I think physical health is just as important as mental health. So the book is talking about my own healing journey because I want people to know that no one is immune from um, anxiety, depression, energetic bankruptcy is what I call it, because to this day, I don't know whether it was postnatal depression. I don't know whether it was exhaustion. I don't know whether it was grief. And to be honest with you, I don't really care because I feel like I was just a normal, fallible human being in the midst of some extremely taxing and long drawn out tough life experiences. Mm. So I I wanted to share that. And I think that's normalized people's experiences. And that's, that's the feedback that I get. And I, 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 
I'm, I love that I've had the opportunity to do that. But then to also share my healing toolkit. And it's, it's the vitality wheel that kind of brings all of that together. So there are eight different spokes. It's all very intuitive. There's nothing there that people would think, oh, gosh, I haven't heard of that before. They may not necessarily associate that with self-care. So, for example, in my vitality wheel, there's exercise and nutrition. We all get that. We all know how important that is. But I also have values and purpose and goal mm -hmm. setting as other spokes. So it's mm -hmm. very much linked with positive psychology. And those those spokes might need a little more explanation for people, but they are just as galvanising and, and, and they fill us with zest as much as social connection and getting a good night's sleep. So that's what the book is all about. I finished writing it, that first draft, three years ago, and I spent um, a lot of time finding an agent and then I had to convince that agent that self-care as a concept had legs. And she kept on saying to me, why don't you make it about mindfulness? Why don't you make it about this? And I'm like, no, it's, it's <laughs> self-care. It, yeah. it can't just be one thing because what people find nourishing differs and what you will need will will vary over time. So it's got to be a broad toolkit from which to draw, you know, because sometimes you need something, you know, if you haven't had a drink of water for a little while, or sometimes you need to immerse yourself in nature or to create order in your, your home life. Or sometimes it's, it's, it's reflecting on what you've accomplished in your day. So it had to be broad. And then of course, mm. when my book came out here in the UK, the same day, there were another, I think, two titles on self-care that came out <laughs> as this wave of things. So we were lucky that, um, yeah, I was just lucky to get the opportunities when I did. But it's fantastic to have it out there in the world. And I hope it, if it can just help one person avoid the energetic bankruptcy that I found myself in, then it was all worth it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so it almost part memoir to some extent, you know, or certainly in terms yes. of that personal experience for you of, of, which I think is a wonderful, you know, obviously because you're talking about it from real lived experience, which people are able to relate to then that brings a greater depth, I suppose, to what you're talking about, but then being able to cover all of, and I can understand your frustration because I know one of the things I really struggle with when communicating a lot of psychological concepts is that people do want to kind of narrow it down to one specific thing and say, well, this is, this is it, you know, these are the three steps or this is the model or, and, and nothing about human beings is three steps or simple or one mm. thing, you know, where, where multifaceted life is multifaceted. So I can really understand, I have empathy for your frustration around, <laughs> you know, trying to, and it, it very much, you know, just as we started out saying, you know, your, your model and, and your ethos is around this mind and body, mm. you know, connection that it, you know, it all needs nurturing. It's not like you can just take one slice of us out and say, well, I just need to look after that bit. Mm. And then everything will be okay. That's not how it works. I will pop all the details of the book and links to it and your vitality wheel in the show notes. While we're talking books, do you have other books that you find that you are regularly recommending to clients, family, friends? You know, sometimes we get yes. find books that we want to just recommend to everyone we come across. Absolutely. The, the book that I keep coming back to is The How of Happiness, by Sonia Lubomirsky. That mm -hmm. was one of the first positive psychology books that I picked up and I just love that it's steeped in research. It's broad, it's accessible, and it's very informative, really easy to read. That's If anyone's interested in positive psychology, learning more about it, that's where I'd start. And then more recently, I love The Strength Switch by Dr. Leah Waters. Ah, oh, yes. And again, so that spoke of the vitality wheel, looking at values and purpose, that would be my recommendation to explore more about that. Um, I've recently just dipped into the willpower instinct by Kelly McGonigal, mm -hmm. which I'm really enjoying. And I'm, what I'm really enjoying there is sort of looking at the links between healing from traumatic experiences, healing from stressful times and looking at how that affects your willpower. Because when it comes down to living a healthy lifestyle, this comes down to the strength of your willpower. It's not easy to make healthy life-giving choices all the time. And as a proponent, as an advocate of self-care, I'm fascinated as, how, as to how we can boost our willpower muscle. So that is a fascinating read. I've only just dipped into that, but I'm really enjoying that. And there's mm -hmm. one more, and it's by Matthew Walker, 
why we sleep. Oh, I, I think I might have heard of this one. Yeah. Yeah, I, I started off with um, Ariana Huffington's book called The Sleep Revolution, and that mm-hmm. just totally changed my perspective of what constitutes good sleep, the value of sleep. Um, Matthew Walker's taking it one step further. I find that I'm getting a deeper understanding of the research behind it because he's, he's a sleep scientist. So both of those books are fantastic. But it, tell you what, if there's one thing that we could revolutionise, if, if we could help everyone get a decent night's sleep, I think the world would be a different place. <laughs> it is amazing, isn't it? It's one thing that I talk about often in workplaces is um, the importance of sleep because I'm personal advocate of sleep I know what it means for me personally I think any of us who have been through newborn babies and small children and those Mm -hmm. prolonged periods of sleep deprivation um, Mm -hmm. have a a much greater respect for sleep (laughs) when we get it back again eventually yes but yeah I'm quite amazed I will ask groups you know, I sort of say, how many, you know, let's talk about sleep, blah, blah, blah. Who here gets seven and a half to eight hours sleep per night regularly? And you'll get a few mm-hmm. hands go up. And then I go back, who gets six? Who gets five? And I've had occasions where I've had people, you know, I say, who gets two to three? And there's hands going up. Mm-hmm. And just from a personal perspective, I'm like, I don't even know how you're even here. How do you even function yeah. on how that amount of right? sleep? Yeah, yeah. And I know there is individual variation, mm-hmm. but on the whole, you know, it is so fundamental to our resilience, mm. um, our emotional coping, um, even yeah. functional things like, yeah, yeah, learning and memory. You know, yeah. Mood. I remember driving, I think, I, you know, small child, unwell, hadn't slept. So I hadn't slept. And I remember mm. driving to go, I thought, I'll go get something. I've got to get something from the chemist, you know, from the pharmacy to. Mm. to help deal with the situation. And I remember driving and thinking, I should not be on the road. And yet there would be people who are driving around in a fairly chronic state of sleep deprivation every day, which is a bit alarming too. So, yes, very passionate about sleep personally. So, And I think I have heard of Matthew. I think I've heard him interviewed on a podcast on Mm. that topic. But, yeah, definitely Mm. one that I'll get hold of Mm. as well. So, cool. Thank you for that recommendation. My pleasure. Susie? Very final question, and I think you've probably covered off most of this, but is there anything else that you, you know, if you've got clients and you say, look, there's three, here's two or three quick wins in terms of your well-being, mental health and, and self-care, mm-hmm. what would they be? Quick wins. I, I think yeah. first and foremost is to identify what does self-care facilitate in your life? Yeah, It's to think about when you are well-nourished, What does that allow you to do or be, okay? Because until you hook into the why, we're not truly motivated to do it, okay? So that's first and foremost. You think about who it is that you aspire to be as a person and you make the connection that self-care is actually the means by which you become that, yeah? So that's that's the number one thing. It's, It's thinking about who it is that you aspire to be and then thinking about, well, what are the kind of nourishing acts that would allow you to be that person? Okay. So as an example, you know, if I imagine saying, well, one of my important roles in life is as a parent and I want to be the best parent that I can be, but if I don't get enough sleep, I know I'm the cranky, horrible parent. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And that's not doing me any good and it's not doing them any good. So is that, that's what you mean by that why? It is. And what I, what I would hope that that would do is to sort of remove some of the barriers to engaging in self-care. And the, probably the biggest barrier for most parents is feeling guilty about it. Mm-hmm. So it's identifying that self-care is the means by which you step up and be the kind of parent that you want to be, and it truly is the ultimate win-win. And I think until you connect the dots there, self-care is just another thing to do or it's an indulgence or it's something we feel guilty about. Mm-hmm. So it's it's seeing that self-care gives you access to your best self and seeing mm-hmm. how that benefits everyone in your life, whether you're a parent or, you know, in, in relationship or you're a manager or you're a volunteer or coach, whatever it is. You know, self-care is the means by which we become the best version of ourselves. Secondly, I'd be looking at well, what's, what kind of nourishment is your body mind calling out for? Because I think intrinsically we all know what we need now you've given that example of a parent who knows they need to prioritize sleep 
And I think that's super important, prioritizing it and actually making sure that you get as, as much time in bed as you know you need to function. But let's talk, take a look at the scenario where you can make all the right choices and still wind up sleep deprived. So in that circumstance, what I would recommend is coming up with some if-then primer statements. Okay, I know that sleep is really important to me. If I can't get a good night's sleep, or if my sleep is disturbed by little ones, then I will dot, dot, dot. And mm -hmm. it's having a toolkit of these if-then primer statements that will circumvent a whole heap of flapping about, resentment, you know, emotional volatility. You just know that, okay, this is what I needed. I didn't get that, so I'm going to do this. And it's a psychological contract that really holds weight. Okay, mm -hmm. if yep. my sleep's been impaired, then I will lie down with my legs up the wall for five minutes at some point in my day, the following day. Or if I had a run planned and it's raining, then I will roll out my yoga mat and do something at home or pop on a video and have a, you know, follow something on the screen. Or I'll just put some music on and have a little boogie with my three-year-old, yeah? Yep. Yep. So it's a toolkit of primer statements and I find yep. that that's really galvanizing. Yeah and in, in goal setting parlance I suppose they're, they're implementation intentions aren't they I've got this goal yes. my goal is to get good sleep yes. I, you know in order to make sure that or increase the chances of my success around attaining that goal it is to implement this if then strategy so if I don't get a good I'm thinking about myself yes. <laughs> um, if because one of the frustrations I find is is i I really want to do a good solid day's work. If I'm sleep deprived, I find it very difficult to concentrate and activate my brain kind of at the pace and level that I want to. So yeah. for me, it might be um, if I don't get a good night's sleep, then I will change my work around so that I do things that require less thinking. You know, I'm allowed yes. to have an admin day today because yes. it doesn't require as much thought, but I'll still feel like I've got something done rather than trying to kind of persevere with something that I know I'm not going to do as effectively and then get frustrated and cranky with myself. Absolutely. Which will probably contribute to a poor night's sleep the next <laughs> night. <laughs> yes. And then one more, I think my favourite would be it's a really, really simple one. If you think of Homer Simpson, when he gets a shock, he goes dolt and he puts the back of his hand to his forehead. Now, if anyone that's in a state of overwhelm or they're feeling tired or stressed out, if you're sitting at a table, rest your hands on the table and rest your head on your hands. Or if you're standing up, you make two very gentle fists and you press the base of the thumb into your forehead or you get down on the floor and you do a child's pose with your head on the floor. There is something hardwired that as soon as you earth your brow, it's like hitting the reboot button. And I love that you can just do it for 10 seconds and it will reduce muscular tension. It will um, lower your rate of respiration and it just instantly makes us connect with our calm abiding center. So that's I'm going to try that. <laughs> I'm going to try that because yes, I know that experience. I know the feeling that you're describing from yoga practice. And I, I certainly have done that many, many times in yoga classes, but I've never thought to do it at my desk or in any other circumstances. So yeah. yes, I'm going to try. I like that idea of the, the head on the desk in a, in a positive way, not they're banging their head against the desk. <laughs> in a restful, recuperative yes, way. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Susie, that is wonderful. I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Um, you know, we've covered so many things that I get really inspired and, and excited by. And I can tell, you know, how, again, our listeners don't have the opportunity to see you in the same way that I do over the computer here. But I can tell just from your body language and, and you know, your smile that this is stuff that you're terribly excited about. And I'm sure that comes through in your voice. So they will be able to hear that. Um, I'm going to pop the details of your website and your book and all of those recommended books um, and other resources that you've given us very kindly over our discussion today in the show notes for this episode so that people can find them and so many more things I could talk to you about but maybe we'll have to do that at another occasion. Oh Ellen it's been a true joy and I'll make sure that I send you a copy of the Vitality Wheel so people can see those oh yes those different that would be fabulous different spokes and, and I hope people feel inspired to go and annotate that and build that self-care toolkit so it, it just brings it to everyday life. Yeah 
Yeah, absolutely. So do I. I I think we've given them a wealth of things to work on in terms of their own self-care and even just things to think about, you know, just that prioritizing yourself um, so that you can be the the person that you want to be in your life for everybody else, I think is a delightful concept. So if there's one thing that our lovely listeners take away, maybe that's it from today's conversation. Thank you again, Susie. I really appreciate your time and your wisdom and all of the expertise that you've shared. It's been an absolute joy and I hope you have a successful and positive remainder of your day. My day's almost over, so (laughs) I'm off to get a restful night's sleep. Thank you so much, Ellen. A deep joy, deep privilege. Thank you. I really do hope that you are inspired to exercise your self-care after that wonderful conversation with Susie Redding. Maybe take a walk, enjoy the outdoors, have a nap or a hot or cold drink, or get on your yoga mat. Listen to what your body and mind are telling you that you need and make yourself a priority. Susie is very kindly providing us with a PDF copy of her Vitality Wheel as a guide to aiding your self-care, and you can download it in the show notes for this episode. Go to potential.com.au forward slash podcast. There, you'll also find links to Susie's website, her social media channels, and a downloadable profile with all of her details and her well-being and self-care tips. And don't forget her great book recommendations. Are you enjoying season two as much as I'm enjoying bringing it to you? Let me know. Shoot me an email at ellenjackson at potential.com.au or perhaps leave a review on iTunes in order to share the love around and ensure that as many people as possible benefit from the wisdom, tips and experience of our guests. I have more amazing guests coming up on the podcast for this season. To be the first to hear about who they'll be and what we'll be discussing, search Potential Psychology on Facebook or Instagram and join our community. Thanks for listening and have a fabulous week.